Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Watch podcast series. I'm John Briggs, Global Head of Debt Strategy. This series helps you cut through the noise of global financial markets with a quick take on the upcoming trends to watch. Hello, everyone. We've seen some quite volatile financial markets this past week. After the week before is week of hawkish central banks, especially from the Fed and the Bank of England. While there's likely been aftershocks from the central bank action into financial markets this week, this past week is really about shortages. This is something that we've addressed before in the past, and actually next week's week we watch, we're going to be discussing from a China perspective with our Chinese economist, Pei Xin Liu. But it's about shortages this week and lots of shortages. UK gas, China energy, shipping containers everywhere, 7.7 million shortfall in cars in the US due to chip shortages, food issues due to Brazil, worries about natural gas and CO2 in Europe that will hamper fertilizer production, so crop yields down there also. It's been quite a week for scary headlines regarding shortages. All this results in a whiff of stagflation. Now, that's not good or tolerable inflation that central banks have been looking for. To be clear, I am not in the stagflation camp for many reasons, but the market did have that tone at various points this week. For what it's worth, stagflation is bad for everything. Things like real assets, real estate, art, gold, wine, they hold their value better, but it's not a great time to scoop up land if you have slow growth, the value of cash is declining, and consumers have less spending power. But still, those are the kind of the assets that will outperform. It's better than other things like cash itself, but true stagflation is just plain bad. And that's been reflected in risk assets this week in particular, as well as in sterling getting hit as the UK is seen as one of the potential centers for stagflation, slowing growth and higher inflation, much of that because of energy prices. Again, this being a durable theme or a long lasting stagflation for months is not our view, but that was the tone this week. So given that, I wanna bring in Brian Dangerfield, who's our co-head of G10FX strategy to talk about these shortages, but particularly on the energy front as he also doubles as our energy strategist. So Brian, rising oil prices has been one of the sparks that has set off the price moves this week and all the discussion about stagflation. What's behind this? Well, thank you very much for having me, John. And it certainly has um, really come to the foreground of the discussion of shortages. And really, like a lot of these shortages, this is not a new story, but it's one that's really capturing the market's attention. We know energy prices and oil prices in particular are a significant portion of the supply chain where you know the impact of higher oil prices and that impact on higher gasoline prices that feeds into transport prices, which you know, is a major factor in a lot of different markets, a lot of different prices um, of goods will be impacted by the price it takes to transport them from where they're manufactured to where they're sold. So energy prices, obviously very critical, not just from gasoline, but also from transportation costs. Really what has been, you know, I, I think this really comes down to a mismatch between supply and demand. And certainly Delta variant has taken some expectations of demand out of the market. But from a supply perspective, we're dealing with um, OPEC plus who's only been slowly returning uh, oil supplies to the market from their prior production cuts uh, from the height of the pandemic. And then you've also added on um, reductions in US supply coming from recent hurricanes uh, that have not yet fully normalized. And then a third driver of um, uh, crude oil moving higher is probably the the surge we've seen in natural gas prices. There is some possibility of switching away from using natural gas, relatively expensive compared to crude oil, which I think is relatively cheap, especially versus natural gas. So um, this is a supply demand mismatch um, that's really been ongoing for a while. Inventories have been drawing down. OPEC has been slow to respond. Um, And so, uh, Really, I think this is uh, at its core, uh, you know, simple supply and demand. And like a lot of these shortages, um, it, it's hard to really say when you're going to get uh, when you're going to see some normalization here. All right. So you just really beat me into my next question, because that is the key question, right, is how long some of these shortages will last. Is there anything on the horizon, OVIC meetings or anything that could clear this up? Or do you think it's just going to be a, more of a natural but potentially drawn out process? Well, I think for every economy, it will be different. But the OPEC meeting on Monday, the October 4th, uh, is going to be an absolutely critical meeting from uh, the perspective of oil markets for, uh, for crude oil. Uh, earlier this year, OPEC committed to raising oil production quotas by 400,000 barrels per day in each month for the final five months of the year. 
So right now, if OPEC doesn't make any changes to its production increases from November onwards, uh, then they're only slated to increase by 400,000 barrels per day in November and December. The okay. international pressure on OPEC to increase that production, to increase the pace of their production, uh, has really ramped up. You know, in the U.S., we had a release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. In China, we had a release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is, you know, very much out of the ordinary. Remember, PPI in China is running over 9% at the moment. There's clearly a desire there um, to try and tamp down energy prices. And certainly in, in Europe now, you know, what we've seen, you know, there's been signs of international demand to lower oil prices from the U.S. and from China. And certainly that's going to ramp up as well from uh, from Europe. And so we'll certainly be watching uh, OPEC on Monday. That's going to be an important point, both from a future supply perspective. They're not going to change for October. That's going to be for November onwards. But it would be an important signal to the market about what OPEC, particularly Saudi Arabia and Russia, uh, what the impact of what do they want to happen with oil markets? Do they want to keep the pressure on by keeping supplies um, uh, relatively low? Or do they want to try and try and relieve some of that pressure uh, by increasing production? So OPEC meeting coming up is going to be pretty critical. Got it. Um, and then quickly, can you comment on recent dollar strength? And again, if the what's that coming from? And if you do think that'll persist also? Well, I think you mentioned stagflation. You know, we're not stagflationists here. Um, but that sort of air of stagflation, higher inflation, and like not the good kind, I guess you would say, if you're looking at central bankers who have been fighting low inflation for so long um, and decelerating growth momentum, that's the kind of combination that leaves the dollar, I think, rel a relative beneficiary. Um, you know, when, when, there, when most global growth stories are moving in kind of the wrong direction, the dollar as a safe haven currency and the global reserve currency tends to benefit in that kind of environment. What you've also seen is not only have energy prices been moving higher and putting pressure on expectations for global growth, but you also have developed market yields moving higher as a result. I really think the moves, you know, really driven by the UK markets, but as you see uh, yields rise, we've had a pretty spectacular rise in US yields as well. And as US yields rise and, you know, that changes the carry to vol balance across a lot of currencies sort of against growth oriented currencies in favor of the dollar. And so um, I think this is a combination of the higher energy prices hurting growth expectations, the lack of synchronized global growth and the fears of stagflation play well into, into supporting safe haven currencies. But then you also have rising developed market yields, um, which change the carry to vol balance for a lot of uh, risk-oriented currencies, including across emerging markets. And that, I think, has also benefited the dollar. Yeah, and certainly that risk off has definitely hit emerging markets here um, in the last week, too. So it'll be interesting to see if that continues. Well, I'd like to say that next week we'll see things calm a bit, but it's that first week of the month where we get the employment report in the U.S., which is going to be a key determinant in the Fed's tapering process. We also have lingering concerns on the U.S. debt ceiling, progress or lack thereof on U.S. stimulus bills, global PMI data, European industrial production data. And, you know, those, those last two, the PMIs and the industrial production data, especially in Europe, is going to be interesting given all of the energy issues um, in Europe and stemming from some of the things that Brian's been talking about. So I think for better or worse in the near term, you know, market volatility may be here to stay for, for a little while. So thanks for joining, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for listening and have a great week. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of The Weekly Watch. Please subscribe to our channel to get future episodes. We also encourage you to explore more of our content on our website and other social media channels.